Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sunday live stream. So we're supposed to do this yesterday, but we got caught up in some things. So today we're going to do a little bit of a catch up. And there's a lot of things to go over. So let's just jump right in. So first of all, uh, on Friday, again, playing catch up. This is pretty positive news for economic factors. And if we can see that everybody is concerned about inflation, well, maybe the Fed is doing the job that it's supposed to be doing. And it looks like the Fed measure shows inflation rose 2.6 in May, which is as expected. Now, for all these different reports that come out, you know that thing, their things are actually skewed. People might say that this isn't the real data, but this is the data that we have. And this is what the Federal Reserve is going by when they decide to, at some point, cut rates. So this is the stuff that we're going to take a look at. And right now, as of Friday, the CPE, Core Personal Expenditures, price index increased just a seasonally adjusted 0.1 for the month and was up 2.6. This may mark the lowest annual rate since March 2021, which is great. I think we can all remember back then. And personal income rose 0.5% a month, stronger than 0.4%. Consumer spending, however, increased 0.2, weaker than the 0.3 forecast. So you've got some positives. You've got a slight, slight negative. But in all in all, really what it comes down to is that this is going as expected for what the Federal Reserve wants. And the Federal Reserve wants is a soft landing, which we all want. Uh, we'll see if it actually plays out, but that is the part for the macro side. Now let's switch over to the crypto side. So as of Friday, uh, ETF inflows were actually positive. I did not know this. I've been doing bouncing around a lot of different places here in Puerto Rico. And uh, I was unaware that the ETF was actually up because the price certainly didn't reflect it. That's for sure. But we saw that uh, Bitcoin ETF saw 73 million in inflows yesterday the fourth straight days of inflows, which I got to tell you, when you take a look at that, you're like, this must be pretty good for crypto digital assets. Things are probably going pretty well. Who were the uh, the same uh, suspects? Yeah, the same people. Grayscale, Fidelity, a little bit of outflows. But of course, BlackRock uh, brings it in with ARK. And there is a positive net flow of 1,213, which you're like, that's pretty good. Now, uh, these are the things we want to see. If we see inflows, people are buying Bitcoin. Price should uh, appreciate, right? Well, not so fast. If we take a look at the net Bitcoin ETF flows, it's still good. I got to tell you, as of June 28th, we had 248,000 Bitcoin total net net flows, right? So we're taking the negative and the positive. 248,000. That's great. And it will, if I could remind everybody that the last time Bitcoin was around 73, I think uh, for this year, was around March or so. And uh, we had 180,000. That was roughly, we were looking at, you know, 80,000 less or somewhere around there. And we had a uh, all-time high over here. So what the heck's happening? We have we have a positive flows. We had a great week. What did the week of Bitcoin do? <laughs> a nice red day. A nice red week, as a matter of fact. And we take a look at this. Of course, what does this mean? Well, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I can tell you that Usually when price action goes down, it's probably because there's more sellers than buyers. I'm just saying, I'm just going to throw it out there. But if we take a look also at another metric, we've taken a look at, at many metrics. We've taken a look at the mining sell-offs, mining inflows and outflows, demand, liquidations, everything else. Also pay attention to this. And this is something that uh, gains a lot of traction and gets a lot of views, might, I might add, when they talk about a supply shock. We hear about a supply. I've heard about the supply shock that's going to happen for the last I don't know, five years. And uh, when there's a supply shock, it means obviously there's not enough to go around, especially in the OTC desks. Well, as we can take a look here from CryptoQuant, new Bitcoin holdings, the OTC desks have seen a significant increase in the last two months, meaning that there is a lot of Bitcoin being held for those institutions if they so choose to buy. Now, we can see positive flows, we can see positive price action, but really what has to happen is demand has to increase. There's, not, there's nothing more to be said about it. So I know people will say, well, there's this metric, or there's that metric. Here's the metric I want to show you. That price down. Bitcoin's still great. Bitcoin could still be the world reserve currency if you want to go down that route. And Bitcoin is fantastic for, you know, banking the unbanked and doing great things. But right now, I'm just telling you, as far as like price action goes, this is where we're at. So... You can look at this in two ways. This is the worst thing of all time for my life and I can't go on. Or you think to yourself, man, that price action at 73,000, 70,000 was a little bit too rich for me. Maybe this could be the time to accumulate a little Bitcoin. Maybe it's a time to dollar cost average and be responsible. And maybe it's just time to take a look at things and go, you know what? I don't think this is overpriced. I think this is undervalued. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. That is essentially where we're at. 
And as a slight reminder, there's a little article here on power law before we move on to the next piece, which was the power law. We did a great video. It was with Giovanni, and uh, he is the uh, astrophysicist that actually explained the power law and talked about it. I uh, linked that in the description. If you don't see it there, uh, of course, if you just uh, do power law, uh, digital asset news, it'll come up. But as a reminder, the power law essentially is a logarithm, logarithmic regression. And I just want to lay this out to everybody as a reminder. I know sometimes we're a little bit uh, hesitant to realize that uh, things take time and we're a little bit impatient. But just remember, if you don't like the price right now, just stick around. It'll change. And this was a little piece about the Bitcoin power loss. Since 2011, Bitcoin's prices experienced exponential growth, obviously, punctuated by significant volatility. I think we're all used to that. Particularly noticeable in 2013 and 2017 bull runs. I would say it was 2021. A retracement follows each peak, which we saw at 73K, yet the overall trend aligns with the power law model's projections. Again, going straight over and to the right. Now, we may go a little bit up, we may go a little bit down, but I think, again, I think we're in the right place at the right time. And as a reminder, as the model extends into 2024, it suggests a stabilizing pattern. The current price aligns closely with the model's expected value. So if you're kind of upset that right now the price is not going the way that you want it to, a little bit under than what you think it is, just remember, in the end of things, as time goes on, Bitcoin usually prevails. It just takes a little bit of time, and that's where patience comes in. So that's where we're at. Again, check out that video with uh, Giovanni with the power locks. It was uh, great. It was an eye-opening uh, experience. And I can tell you, it makes me a lot more calm in this space as where things are going. So that takes care of the crypto part. Let's switch gears to legal. This one's interesting because there's been a lot of talk on this channel. I'm not a big fan of, of the SEC. Granted, they're just guys trying to do their job. <laughs> and maybe there's some other influences on the outside, which seems to be relatively easy to to ascertain, but uh, there was a, a court ruling just yesterday, or excuse me, two days ago, and it looks like it's positive for crypto and digital assets. But wait, there's a wrinkle. This is from Cody Carbone. Uh, he is the chief policy officer at Digital Chamber, and he, roll, and he rolls out with this. The court rules that just because a token was part of an investment contract in the past, it doesn't mean it should always be considered a security. And this is from Judge Amy Berman Jackson, the U.S. District Court of the District of Columbia, providing the clarity the crypto industry deserves. Yeah, debatable. On secondary sales atones. Take a look at her opinion. And this is pretty important for something like, oh, I don't know, like Solana. Now, Solana hasn't explicitly been labeled as a security. However, it has been named in lawsuits against centralized exchanges, most notably Kraken, as being a security. So if they're if in the lawsuits, they're naming it as a security, not saying individually it is. If you're on the big Solana bandwagon, don't attack me too hard in the comment section. I'm just saying that if this actually happens and they had maybe mentioned it as a security, doesn't mean for all time it is a security. And this is a ruling by Judge Amy Berman Jackson. Getting deeper into it, Ellen Terra, excellent follow. Go check her out. She says, uh, again, a big win for clarity over secondary market sales digital assets. Jackson Smith has dismissed the SEC government claim that the secondary sales of Binance's BNB token qualify as securities under the Howey test, citing Ripple's judge and Elisa Torres' opinion that the economic reality of the token transactions matter. Sorry about that. In her opinion, she states, and this is the long opinion, the government's reliance on the assertion that the crypto assets are the embodiment of the investment contract and its argument at the hearing about the nature of the tech and the interdependence of the platform and the performance of every token is not enough, standing alone to bring secondary scales of BNB under the investment contract rubric, which sounds pretty good. And right there, you should just stop because right now you can just say, this is fantastic. And there's a win for crypto and digital assets, and we're going to move forward and we're great. And that's all I got to say. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper. And right next to it, it's John Reed Stark. John is a uh, interesting individual. And John, if you don't know, President John Reed Stark Consulting, Senior Election Fellow, Duke University, former Chief SEC Office of Internet Enforcement. And yes, 
he's probably going to be a little biased towards the SEC side. I like to follow John. I like to follow John on X and see what he has to say, because if I'm just in an echo chamber, I'll only get my information and I can't see the other side. If I can argue the other side more effectively than that side, then I win. And if I can't bring this information to you, I think we're all going to lose. This is what John says. He goes, look, I must disagree. He leaves out a very long case about Binance's motion to dismiss the SEC and enforcement action is mostly denied in a thoughtful and meticulous 89-page decision by Judge Jackson, the Political Securities and Exchange Commission. And he goes on for long. I'm not going to read it here. I'll have a link in the description. You can check it out. And then, of course, someone is like, well, maybe we need your opinion here. But the thing is about this, and of course, he goes on to the same thing on this piece. Really, it comes down to this. Whether it be a win or a loss, regardless of it, I think it comes down to it's not so much about who is winning this battle. Really, it just comes down to this. Okay, you're going to have your points. We're going to have our points. We don't really care. Really, what it comes down to is we just want some clarity. It's not that hard. It shouldn't be that hard, but it is. And it seems like the SEC is fighting us at every chance they can possibly get. And Paul Gruel, he is the uh, lead counsel for Coinbase. He just defers here to uh, Metal Lawman. So this is what I would have tweeted. And this is what Lawman states. And it makes a lot of sense. Judge Torres and Jackson, we just talked about, disagree with judges Rakoff and Filer. I think I said that right. On whether sales of tokens on secondary markets may be securities offerings. So you had two judges, yes, two judges really not, no. Judge Jackson disagrees with Judge Rekoff on whether stablecoins are securities. Judge Jackson rules that Binance's simple earned crypto lending program is not a security, while Judge Ramos ruled that the Gemini earned program is a security, and so on and so on. It's foundation of the whole notion of a society governed by the rule of law that citizens are entitled to know what the law is before they are charged with violating the law. And that's a big thing. The thing is, is that we've had multiple centralized exchanges go to Gary Gensler, and sit in the SEC's office and go, what do you want from us? Just let us know so we can do it. Essentially, bending the knee, and they're like, we'll tell you what it is. Wells notice, and we'll sue the pants off you. And it just makes you go crazy. And of course, Gary will sit here and say, well, we know what the, what the laws are because they've already been established. Well, obviously not, because we don't have enough clarity is what it is. They may think it is. And really what it comes down to is this. If it only is up to the judges, which essentially it is, we're going to have to keep going and fighting harder and fighting harder. I said this a long time ago. All the centralized exchanges and all the different organizations should have already teamed up a, a long time ago and sued the SEC. The Coinbase already just did it last week, which I said they should have done a long time ago, and just get this out in the open. Tell us what a security is. Tell us what a commodity is. Tell us what a currency is. Let us know what the paper is. The paperwork can go from there. I know what you're saying right now before we go on, which is you're like, Rob, who cares? because we don't need those guys because crypto is inevitable. That is very true. But the thing is, is that do you want this to take a couple of years, five years, 10 years, or do you want this to take 20, 30, 50 years? And before you say, well, that doesn't make any sense, it does make sense. Because if you take a look at just go through and take a look at politics and where things are going, when you have somebody that is pro Bitcoin and pro crypto, things start to move pretty damn fast. Take a look at El Salvador. When it's not that way, things move pretty darn slow. So if you're like me and you're like, you got kids and grandkids, you're like, hey, I just want this for my kids. Do you want them to wait another 50 years for this? Or do you want to get this out in the open and just go, tell us what it is and we'll get it going and we can have a real discussion. That's really what it comes down to. Let me know what you think about how wrong I am in the comments section. Anyhow, to finish this up, but even experienced securities lawyers do not know from one day to the next what a given judge might rule in a crypto case. Again, we need clear laws. There is no way a Howey test from the 1920s is going to actually tell us exactly what a security, a commodity, or a currency actually is. Well, it's all for securities. That's a Howey test. How is the average citizen entrepreneur supposed to know what is and what is not permitted? It's sad state of affairs. Meanwhile, our friends in the EU, I want to say this a couple of times. Our friends in the EU see a huge influx of capital investment and intellectual capital as their MICA regulations go into effect. And this was just passed about a year ago or so in the EU, which gives clear guidelines or reasonably clear guidelines for crypto and digital assets to be traded and to be used in centralized exchanges. This is a problem. And this is what I hate, because if we don't get clarity, we're stuck on the sidelines and we're watching all that capital just and a brain drain just go across the pond. Is that what America is? Apparently that's what it is right now. <sighs> and that's it.
I will step off my soapbox, but let me know what you think about that in the comment section. So a little bit, little bit of a rant, sorry about that. Now let's get into a PSA or public service announcement. I don't know if you have altcoins, but if you do, and they're based around AI, like Fetch AI or Ocean or AGIX Singularity, just know that if you have Coinbase, there's supposed to be a merger between those three AI platforms, crypto platforms, and they are not going to help you on Coinbase for that merger rejection. Here's what happened. So this is actually uh, uh, the Fetch, yeah, Fetch AI founder. And he states, this is actually a tweet. The industry is, uh, excuse me, this is not what he stated. It was just the, uh, the piece there. The industry is looking ahead to the July 1st comm commencement of the Artificial Super Intelligence Alliance. I got to tell you, that sounds like an evil organization, but sure. And that would be, uh, gosh, what is that? Tomorrow, I think. Yeah, wow, July 1st. The merger between Fetch AI, Singularity Net, and Ocean Protocol. And uh, it states in an unusual move, Coinbase has come to disclose that it does not plan to support the tripartite token merger. And respond to this, this is uh, whom again? I think I said it right, nailed it. Now he is the uh, founder of Fetch AI. Noted that this will not be an issue as centralized exchanges do not need to either list or relist FET. Now what he's talking about is only for Fetch AI. He's not talking about Ocean Protocol or Singularity. He's talking just about Fetch because it states because Fetch is already listed on these platforms. And what he says specifically is Fetch is ASI. ASI is Fetch. Ocean and AGIX are merging into Fetch. Centralized exchanges don't need to delist or relist Fetch if it's already there. If you hold Fetch, do nothing. This is what he states. If you hold Fetch, do nothing. We are working hard to resolve any issues. Timeline has not changed. Coinbase has only announced that the swap will be via custodial wallets. Will be via custodial wallets. I believe that they have, Coinbase has its own wallet and you can do it within there. All exchanges have their own reasons and methods, but mergers going ahead and we are seeing huge support from all. Of course, that's not Coinbase if you have it. And then uh, Crypto Fox says, this is not right. Bradley says, what WTF? This doesn't make it clear at all. Please just be clear. Coinbase has said they're not supporting. I have to do something with my fetch on Coinbase. What do you mean do nothing? And that's pretty much where we're at. Let me see something. No. No. And the same as June 27th. Ah, okay. Well, here we go. Artificial. Let's see. How to migrate your Ocean AGX tokens on merge day. Turkin merger is not open yet, but where it scans again, it happens tomorrow. Yeah, and this is from the official site. So let me just do this. There is a site. I'm going to post this. Right here, a fetch ocean. And I do this because I do not want you to get scammed on all the crazy stuff that is out there right now. So what I'll do for all those people, I put that in the comment section. I also put it in the description. So if you're watching the replay, please watch that replay and go from there. I see, I see. So there's a... There's a site, you have to go there, you have to connect your wallets and do this. Unfortunately, if you have it on Coinbase, there's no way you can do that. You would have to use the Coinbase wallet. Yeah, this isn't looking good. And this is probably why, yeah, let's see. No one's responding on Twitter. That's awful. Well, I will say this. As I understand it, there's a way to do that within the Coinbase wallet. And uh, if somebody else knows uh, the, exactly what they're doing, but don't see much right here. So unfortunately, 
that's pretty much why I sold some of my fetch because I couldn't get a clear answer and it's on Coinbase. Anyhow, that's all we have for that one. Go through this piece right here. Hopefully there's more information as they, this is from the ASI Alliance. They should put out something. You can check the comments or check the uh, description. And that takes care of that. And then lastly, before we get into a little Q and A, which I think there's a lot of questions already, all-time highs. So I was perusing this great website, coingolive.com. I don't know if you guys knew this, but TonCoin is only 6% away from its all-time high. I thought it was interesting because TonCoin came out of nowhere. And right now, if you didn't notice, but TonCoin has flipped Doge to be number nine ahead of Dogecoin. And Cardano slipped to 11, Avalanche, Shron. I don't even know why some of these are actually here. But... Uh, this actually comes down to a lot of people are speculating on the action that's happening. First of all, one of the uh, big tapper games, Hamster Combat, is going for a Guinness World Record. And the reason why they're going for a record is because they have so many new users in the app itself. And I think they have, no, this, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. This is 200 million users. And this is uh, what they have for their, uh, for their game itself. Here's what we have. It took Pokemon Go, a 2016 reality game, 33 days to get to 150 million users. Telegram-based game Hamster Combat surpassed 150. And the, the team calls it a crypto exchange CEO simulator. You can earn as many virtual points. You just hope that their loyalty will be rewarded with future airdrops, which is supposed to happen in July. The team has applied for a Guinness World Record as the first YouTube channel to gain over 10 million subscribers in one week. That's crazy. Yeah. And they actually beat Mr. Beast. They have 22 million in one month, and uh, he only had 20. So these things are happening. And I think with TonCoin, it's why things are actually moving on the space itself. And it's uh, lend itself to a lot of different things. But just be aware that if you're here for uh, just a big airdrop, you're going to see a bunch of these airdrop farm videos, and it's real. People will just tap the game to get the token. So don't think like uh, there's not a bunch of bots and things going on behind the scenes. That is an issue. And that's an issue that's happening right now. But there's also one more thing on this uh, CoinGo Live. I thought that uh, Ton was the winner here as far as negative 7% from its all-time high. But if you scroll down, what the heck? This is called Caspa. One of my, one of my little altcoin holds that I have but uh, they hit their all-time high yesterday, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Caspa, all-time high. Why? Well, there's a couple reasons. First of all, Marathon Digital, which is uh, responsible for a heavy amount of Bitcoin mining here in the United States, they announced that they're actually mining Caspa right now. And they want to diversify what they actually uh, are mining. And since Caspa is a proof of work, and some people say that... Uh, it has solved the trilemma. I will let the people in the comment section debate that. I'm not going to get into it. But here's why they're doing it. There's actually a couple of reasons. So, Caspa's fair launch, proof of work digital asset with no pre minor ICO. The consensus mechanism uses Ghost DAG, the cyclic acrylic graph, a cyclic graph, decentralized, <laughs> decentralized acrylic graph, protocol for high transaction throughput. Caspa Network currently possesses. Per processes one block every second, allows for fast transactions, providing cast miners with opportunity. Caspa currently has a 3.9 billion market cap. Circling supply is 24 billion. I think the max is 28 billion, so it's only 4 billion away, which seems, seems a lot like a lot, but a lot better than some of the other projects. And uh, this is essentially the, excuse me, directed acyclic graph, DAG, versus Bitcoin in the linear blockchain. But also the big thing is this is because I believe it's today, uh, Caspa just launched their KRC20 token, which allows for fungible tokens on the Caspa network. So you can have fungible tokens, you can have inscriptions, you can have ordinals, you can have NFTs as time goes on. And that was the big reason for this big, huge jump. I think one of the reasons for Mara to do the mining, because, hey, revenue stream is a revenue stream. And that's it for today. So look, if you liked today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything to talk about is time sensitive.